Thanks. We have a couple notes or questions in terms of Jewish American uh, diaspora Israeli relationship. And when we were preparing, you know, one of the things I brought up uh, a couple things. One, there's, there's one particular question is, you know, do we consider ourselves a Jewish Americans or American Jews? You referenced that earlier in a couple of your stories, but I think to broaden the conversation, or broaden the question rather, would be to say that um, when we were preparing, I was talking about Rabbi David Hartman, who's what, if you haven't read his work, you should. He's a fabulous, super pluralist on all things Israel. And one of the things he said, uh, he died about 10 years ago, but one of the things he was famous for saying is that Israel is too important to leave to the Israelis. And you know, on some hand, in hand, it's a chuckle. On some level, when we think about like the picture of Rabbi Lipton's great grandparents or great grand grandparents, um, like all the work that they were doing as diaspora Jews to ensure that there was an Israel that we can celebrate today. I mean, the notion that we're celebrating 75 years for something that they worked so hard for is, you know, hopefully they they are schlepping at us for what they've done and what we what we are continuing continuing to celebrate, but. When we think about the work that they did and generations that they did from a diaspora relationship and how they were supporting Israel as not yet Israelis, some of them sounds like became Israelis, um, I wonder what is our role today as diaspora Jews? There was a time when we sent money and Israel needed our money, and now Israel is the startup nation and maybe they don't need our money and it's not enough just to send money. So what is there for the, the relationship, whether you agree with the politics or not, what might the relationship be? Um, between Jewish Americans or uh, Jewish diaspora, not, not just Americans, and Israel. You know, you think about, you know, uh, Rabbi Lipton's grandfather or grandparents, and back in the early 1900s, go back to 1800s, 1700s, there was not much going on in Israel. You know, today we take the luxury of going to Israel and seeing the beauty of us celebrating in Tel Aviv and in Jerusalem. And it's the most amazing country you could think of in terms of so many things, innovative and in every area possible. It's this global, you know, people talk about it, not just from, but from an innovative scale, uh, scale and a sense of mind. You talk about it from all areas. They're the highest ranking in so many things. And this wasn't like that before, you know, not too long ago. And you know, going back, you know, for many, many years. And I think that back then, there still was a sense of urgency to connect to Israel. And, you know, 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, there always was a sense of urgency to connect to Israel. And I think that's because, and there was no politics because there was no government there of ours. Because I think it defies that. It goes so way beyond that. You know, in the 1700s, the founder of the Chabad movement, Rabbi Shneur Zalman, he founded a charity. And the charity was to support the Jewish people living in Israel. There wasn't many, but there were those that trekked and made tremendous sacrifices to move to Israel to, because this is our holy land and we need to have Jewish presence there. And he would send and get people to send money. He was even sent to jail because there were people that didn't like him that made conspiracies that he was supporting the Turkish government because he was in Russia at the time and Israel was under the Ottoman Empire, so he was supporting them and you know, just sending money to needy Jews, to those who were living and, and they didn't have anything. They were just... They were, you know, the, 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 the means that they had was so little, but he, support, he was sending support. Until today, that charity still exists, helping thousands and thousands of families that are needy that don't have much in Israel. And so there is still a form of charity beyond the, the political scheme of things, supporting Israel. They're supporting the people, our brothers and sisters there, and uh, being there for them. And I think that when we think about, um, about our relationship with, you know, how, what that means to Israel and and, and as us to create a society connected, there's connecting to the people of Israel and it's connecting to the idea of Israel. Because the idea of Israel defies just the physical land. It's a concept, like I mentioned earlier, where it's all about us transforming this world, transforming the physical space and making it holy, making it something better, creating a beautiful atmosphere around us. And in our case, a Jewish community, I think when we have a strong Jewish community, we are automatically connecting to Israel. Uh, there's a, a t-shirt, I'm sure it's still popular in Israel, when you uh, used to be on Ben Yehuda Street, now they're allowed on Ben Yehuda Street for some violent t-shirts. Uh, it, it, uh, uh, it was an F-15 on the front, 
and it said, don't worry, America, Israel's here for you. It was something like that. Am I getting it right? People, somebody bought that shirt. You own the shirt, right? Yeah. Uh, the point of the shirt is uh, showing up matters. And, and Israel did show up. We, I mean, we like to talk about how Israel showed up for America militarily, and, and that shirt was sort of a little bit of a dig to say, you think you're the big brother to us, we're really the big brother to you. We helped you through the Cold War. We, you know, there's all sorts. There's, there's great stuff on YouTube these days if you want to watch all about things Israel did in the 80s and 90s. But the point is, showing up makes a huge difference. The challenge. I would, I would go back a couple questions to the question about the what happened. What do you say when somebody criticizes Israel? I, I want to combine the first two questions. What, what do you do when somebody criticizes Israel and you're 19 years old and you're a sophomore in college and all you really want is to get that person out on a date and not debate world politics and defend an entire people or a country you don't really understand? We here, so, so David Hartman's son, Daniel Hartman, wrote a great article recently uh, that I've been passing out to everybody because I think it's wonderful. But he categorizes American Jews into four categories. I'll just share two. One of, the, one of the axes is committed and uncommitted to Israel. The question about what you say when somebody criticizes Israel comes from a committed Jew, committed to Israel Jew, meaning I want to, I want to have a response. I'm committed to answering that question. Now I want you to imagine yourself as a 19-year-old American in college. You're not sure if you're committed or not, so you don't have to answer the question. You can opt out. You don't have to show up. And that's the problem that I think we as older Americans now have to talk to our kids about, which is how do you show up in that moment when that's not the conversation you wanted, but that's the conversation you're getting, because they're going to keep getting it, and we probably haven't educated them well enough to be able to answer it in a great way. Um, because we're still working on our answers, by the way. Um, so I think it's about, I think our job as American Jews, I think what the, the point that, that David Hartman was making is, you can't leave Israel just to Israelis, that's fine. Um, you know, we could say a lot about what that means and what he was saying about that. Um, I would say the same thing about America, don't leave America just to Americans. I think uh, we should rely on how we impact the rest of the world too. But I, I like the first part of the question better, uh, or the statement, which is Israel's too important. Israel's too important to us as American diaspora Jews and too important to Judaism to be uncommitted. Uh, and so we better prepare our kids to be able to have a committed conversation uh, and to respond to those hard questions. And I think that means we have to, we have to talk like, I think, Jen's example of, we talk to our kids about sex, we talk to them about drugs, we know they're going to have these conversations. Uh, the example has been used a lot lately uh, of African American parents have to talk to their kids about what you do when you get pulled over. Well, Jews have to talk to their kids about what you do when somebody comes up to you, as they did to me when I was in college, and uh, they were a Native American student, and they, I was in a class, there were 10 of us. I was so proud of my Judaism, it was an anthropology class. I talked about my Judaism every day. I thought it was so cool because I was the white Jewish kid. I, I got to you know, be a little different. And then she says to me, how come our country gives more money to Israel than it does to Native Americans who've been here the whole time? And all I want to do is walk out the door and not be in that room. Because I didn't know how to answer that question. But our kids are going to get that question. So I think we have to prepare them to be able to have a committed answer and say, look, Israel is more than what you're making it out to be. There are good reasons, by the way, why America gives so much money to Israel. Uh, and uh, Israel is not what you read in the news on the front page of whatever paper you're reading. And I know that because I know Israelis, because I've been there, because Israelis live in my community. Uh, I can tell you about the complexities of it if you're willing to have a longer conversation. Well, you first have to explain to them what a newspaper is. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and, and how to fold them out. Exactly. That's right. Yeah, that, that's right. You fold them out like this. Um, I, I don't have the slightest idea how to answer this question, but I do want to respond to 
to the statement that you read of David Harden about Israeli, uh, that Israel is too important to leave to the Israelis. Just as the response that you made that America is too important to leave to the Americans. And I would suggest just the opposite. That we can have an interest in understanding and knowing what our connection is. As I said earlier, spiritual connection. But if we want to have uh, if we want to have a stake in the game, if we want to actually have a voice in what happens in Israel, we need to be in Israel. That that I believe that citizens of the United States have a voice in what happens in the United States, and they take and those who have not been in the United States and want to have a voice about what. Uh, voting or, or turning or making sure that particular things happen, they can bring our attention to that. But ultimately, if they're willing to step forward and commit themselves to doing that by taking those steps to become a citizen and, and taking the right, the, the opportunity to embrace that and make a commitment to that, then they have a voice in how that's going to proceed. And I feel the same way about what's happening in Eretz Yisrael that we can view it, we can respond to it, we can feel it, but ultimately it's not up to us, in my humble opinion, to make those decisions for others. If we want to make that commitment, we need to, to have some skin in the game, and we need to be able to do that. Yes, we should engage. Yes, it's about relationships. Yes, it's about interactions. And yes, we have our ideals of where, what we would like to see, but if we want to initiate change, I think we have to personally invest in ourselves in order to have a, a voice in that particular conversation about self-determination. Rabbi Sam, do you have Just a, a quick, uh, quick added point. I said, if we think about it, you know, and you know, we have the different elements of us as a Jewish people and our relationship to the land of Israel, and then there's this, this modern political, uh, you know, political state of Israel, you know, think about if you have a, a, a you know a family member, a child, a, a sibling. You don't have you don't always approve of their actions. You don't always approve of everything they do. You may want them to do something different. And like the question was before, how do you connect with the values of something you feel like the values are not living up to you? And as Robert Brown mentioned, there's every Jew has a different set of what they think the values should be. And so at the core of it, if we focus on how we relate ourselves to Israel. And then, of course, you can always want someone to change and try to advocate, etc., etc. But at the core of it, it has to remain our connection is eternal. Our connection is beyond all of those differences as well. So I just, oh. I want to say that for a long time, I, re I agreed with Rabbi Lipton's position. Like, my kid, it doesn't matter what I think about what Israel should do, because it's not my kid that's going into the army if a, if a decision is A or B. And I make the distinction about different things within Israel, personally, like the Kotel. I feel like the Kotel is a place for Jewish people. It happens to be in the current land and state of Israel, but the Kotel is a place for Jews around the world. It's, it is determined with political things, but to me that feels like I can have an opinion as an American Jew because that's a Jewish spiritual place. You talk about Jewish spiritual homeland versus political homeland, whereas borders this and Green lines that it's not my it's not my family that's that's literally putting their life on the line, and the current political situation I think bridges both of those things. It is both the political situation and also has significant could potentially have significant impacts for the spiritual homeland that's there. So I I haven't yet determined where I stand because I'm not a voting citizen of Israel, and yet the voting citizen it may have impact on me as an American Jew. So it's. It's not as clear as the hotel or a green line. 